Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Right, we face. are recording. Okay. Welcome to Health Oddity, episode 34. Uh, this week, we're with the usual suspects plus a very special guest. But firstly, I'll just uh, introduce our usual suspects, which is James St. Pierre. How are you doing? I am doing exceptionally well, and I'm very excited to be speaking to our guest this week. Fantastic. And what about you, Peter? Top of the morning to you, even though it's the afternoon. But that might be a clue. So there you go. You haven't got Guinness as well, have you? Are you, are you allowed to do that these days? I don't know. Am I allowed to say things like that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, Rachel, I'm, Rachel, I'm Rachel, struggling Rachel, to navigate this century, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, we're starting off in this manner, are we? Right, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, we have, we've had some great guests on this year. It's been, it's been so fun to do the podcast. You, those of you who've been listening to the podcast since the beginning, we're now 34 episodes in. And each week we're starting to get some of the best people out there giving you, I don't know, not only quality information, but people who are thinking really outside the box and living their ideas. So they're not just giving all the talk, they're actually going out there and doing it and performing at really high levels. And this week's guest is no different. We have Fionba or Finn, uh, as we like to call him, uh, Tulin, and he is uh, someone I met. Well, it was about the same time I met Peter and James. So back in the SMK in 2015, which is a kettlebell certification that we were doing with Strength Matters. And there was a load of people there that were just really top people. And Finn was there. And uh, I remember you were just smashing the swing test. Um, you were in my group along with, actually, we were all in the same group, I think, being taught by Mark Rifkin, weren't we? Yeah. So we had a great tutor in that certification and we all got to know each other. But since 2015, and I think it was starting to kick off for you, Finn, that you were entering into kettlebell sport. You hadn't started Virtue. And Finn's got an amazing business over in Ireland, in Belfast, uh, training loads and loads of people from the city, taking them to very high levels. So he's a gym owner like us guys, uh, training a variety of different people. But Finn is also a world champion in the sport of kettlebell sport or GS sport or give Roy sport uh, in two different weight classes. And it's a tough sport. Those of you who listen to the Paul McElroy uh, interview, he talked about how tough it is. It is something that I dabble in, but no way the same level as, as Finn. Um, so I'm going to pick his brains on kind of how he suffers through that sport, but it's a tough sport to excel in. And he does that and he's set, setting records all the time. So you were just starting your journey when we first met you and you're now five years in and a world champion. So it's going to be fantastic talking to you. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Absolutely. It's been, um, it's been a while, five years, six years to say the least. And I just want to say thanks for having me on today. It's been it's strange, you know, coming on and you have guys like Dan John and Paul McElroy and Chris Lowe, who you work with, um, some top, top guys in their field. And... Um, I just want to say thank you. And also it leads me to my second point. Then uh, how has it taken you guys so long to get me on? <laughs> <laughs> We've been too busy, mate. We were just talking about that. We've been trying to pin you down, but you're doing too much stuff. Yeah, yeah. You kept turning us down um, saying you had better offers, I think it was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is going to... Yeah, we've got loads of questions for you anyway. Anyway, yeah, it's a bit delayed here. It's like we're working on international time here. So, um, yeah, uh, I wonder if you could kind of, I know that, you know, going into people's backstory, you know, there's loads of different ways we can frame it. But, you know, you're a relatively young guy. You've, you've achieved quite a lot, you know, in a very short period of time. So I know that you didn't always start as a strength athlete. You didn't always start as a gym owner. So why don't you just give me a bit of background about what led you into this game and, kind of where you are in terms of your mindset, what you're trying to teach and what you're trying, how you're trying to impart your knowledge at the moment. Yes, uh, fair enough. Um, so I've been a, a strength coach now for, well, a, a trainer for about eight or so years. And my 
my passion and my, and my love for strength and fitness basically stem from my early childhood and right through all the many wins and many failures in sport. Um, growing up through my early teens, I played football, I soccer, um, and I played Gaelic football. And then later into my early teens, I, I ran competitive cross country and I ran competitive middle distance for a local athletic club here. Uh, you know, over the past eight years, I've, you know, traveled the world gaining the highest achievements and in, in fitness qualifications within the fitness industry, basically where I met you guys. Um, and I've been, I've had the honor of being coached and mentored by some of the top strength and conditioning coaches on our planet. Uh, you know, Don John, Paul McElroy, um, uh, Pavel, Mark Rifkin, Steve. Dave Cotter, you know, the name of a few. And basically, you know, combining my, I think combining my career as an athlete and as a coach, I believe it's given me basically a rare and very potent mix of strength, condition and knowledge. And all of my years of, of sport have basically, you know, stemmed from all of those many levels of, of, of wins and, and failures. And it's funny you say about me being in that, um, mindset of kettlebell sport. I think some people forget that I I ran competitive cross country and I ran that lonely level of sport. So moving into GS, it kind of wasn't as hard as I, I initially anticipated, to say the least, because you know yourself, um, kettlebells are, whether it be hardstyle or gear boy sport, it is quite lonely at times and it is quite challenging mentally, more so than physically, in my opinion. Especially gear boy sport, as Paul McElroy says one time on your podcast, it's uh it's like fighting with Satan himself. Um <laughs> so uh <laughs> Well I know that. I mean so, I've just done I've just done what I mean, I'm yeah. trained by Paul McElroy myself, and I know that you he he's worked from, with you from the start, and at the moment he's your strength and conditioning coach as well. And and he doesn't suffer fools. And, and Peter as well is, is being trained by Paul. And I, I have not come up with an excuse that he's accepted yet. Um, yep. <laughs> but what I do know is, is that, that there, is, there is a kind of crossover between that endurance world where you're just knuckling down and sucking up the pain. And you can, that transfers quite yeah. well to, to kettlebell sport where you are sitting there with two weights bearing down on you for 10 minutes. And uh, I know I'm at a very low level compared to you. I know what it's like just doing what I'm doing and you're doing it with two 32 kilo kettlebells for 10 minutes. And it's crazy. You know, I can't even think myself into that weight yet. I don't even know how to get there. I haven't even got two 32. I've only got one. <laughs> it's the best way to keep it. So what did you find, uh, Finn? Because I remember one, when, once when you came over here and we talked and I remember you said that you, you, did you run the Belfast, was it the Belfast Marathon or something that you yes, went Winter and Fest. you did a marathon and you did it in some ridiculous yeah, yeah, yeah. time, like your first marathon? I'm the type of person who does things so sporadically in terms of, well, I used to be, not anymore. I think I've learned that through many of the failures I've had. Most of the failures that I've had have came through sporadic, just sporadic nature. But I'll never forget the time. It was 2012 and it was... The, the Olympics, the London, we had the Olympics in, in London, basically. And at the time, I was working in a local leisure centre, being a, a pool attendant. And it was a Sunday afternoon, and the marathon was on, the, in the Olympics, the London marathon. And at the time, I was coming back from an injury. So I was running. I was running was very slow. I was just getting back into it, a wee small touch. And I'll never forget the time that I was watching the London marathon, and I went, do you know what? I could do this and uh, I you know I had a few years running experience but the Dublin marathon was about it was about nine weeks later or so um, so I it was that Sunday I was watching so I just clicked on to the Dublin marathon website on the phone went and signed up and then after I was just like oh what the fuck have I just done here and uh, <laughs> I'll never forget the time that I I'll never forget that I rang my, I rang my running coach at the time I gave him a phone call and I was like, uh, Mick, I've just signed up for the Dublin Marathon in nine weeks' time. And he was he he was just like, what are you doing? But I threw myself into the deep end. And 
I was 22 years of age at the time and I ran a 240 marathon and I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually, I was the first under 25 in, in the Dublin marathon at that, at that time. And I came, I think it was 56th or so out of like 15,000 people. Um, was, That's not bad. If it wasn't too bad, yeah. <laughs> not too shabby. It took me about, I think it's taken me about eight years to recover from it mentally. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll never forget the time after the, the marathon. We were in Dublin and my girlfriend Kiva was there. And I went, we went back to the hotel after the marathon and I, my body was completely in bits. And she was just like, right, get ready. We're going to shopping. And I went, oh, <laughs> she had me in Dublin shopping. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's too... which is horrible at the best of times, right? No, Not no. just Dublin, I mean, anywhere, but blimey. <laughs> There's two points there that I want to pick. I mean, one of which I, I remember working with a band about 20 years back and they booked their first gig before they even written their first song. So there's kind of just like that impetus. Yeah, yeah. Of, I, I, we've got to do something now. We can't just sit around and pretend, be an armchair yeah. philosopher. We've got to get out there and do it. And then the second thing you picked up, yeah. I picked up, is you had a coach back in 2012. So right from the start, yeah. you've been thinking about this isn't just something I do on my own. This is sometimes I, I kind of know that I want to pick the best minds to kind of help me fast track my results. Absolutely. Because to be honest, when I first picked up my... Now, this probably goes way back to when I was 16 years of age. And like I played football and Gaelic football from I was no age, from I was eight or nine years of age. So I always had a coach or a mentor. You play a sport as a young as a young boy, I had you were always having somebody there to guide and direct you. And I always took a lot of I, I always took a lot of accountability from that. That you always you do need somebody there to take it off your hands basically. So going back to whenever I had my first ever coach like on a one-to-one -one type basis was when I whenever I was 16 years of age and um so whenever I was 16 years of age so my name is Finbar but whenever I was 16 I was relatively overweight and I had a nickname called Fatbar so <laughs> so kids are, <laughs> kids are so evil like but uh looking back on it but whenever I was 16 years of age I I asked my parents um to to buy me a personal training session with one of the local coaches here in Belfast, a guy called Liam Shannon. And he is a pretty well-off MMA coach and has, has grown to be. And he's trained a, a lot of MMA fighters who fight at a relatively high level all around Europe and all around the world. But going back to that, that one day, it was my 16th birthday and my, my parents bought me my first uh, personal training session. And that was my first introduction to... Uh, kettlebell and barbell training so he taught me the I can remember that I can re very fondly remember the exact training session he taught me the kettlebell swing the kettlebell snatch the barbell back squat the barbell deadlift and the barbell bench now the barbell bench was taught on a smith machine which <laughs> is not is not is not recommended uh, <laughs> but looking back on that one day you know um, I would never have thought that utilizing those tools from whenever I was 16 years of age and utilizing those four core movements would bring me to the level of strength that I believe is world-class right now. Um, and since that day, the kettlebell has been a massive part of my life. And I've always, always valued having a coach there to be accountable to, because you guys know yourselves, having a coach, it doesn't it's not about just having accountability. To me, it's more about having structure and it's having guidance and it's taking it's taking it out of my hands. And I've always had the the principle and the ethos of if you look at the best in the world at any level of sport, whether it be Usain Bolt, whether it be George St. Pierre, whether it be Mike Tyson, whether it be you know Lewis Hamilton, they all have coaches, they all have mentors, they all have people to fall back on. And for me, that was always something that I've strived to have as, as a coach um, and a number of people to fall back on. Um, another big part of that is like, you guys know yourselves, you're business owners and you're, I'm looking after so many people and I have realized myself, if I've tried to write my own programs, you, you'll always take the easy way out, you know? Um, and the way I look at it is, 
Um, I'm a big believer in walking the walk and talking the talk. And being able to walk the walk is purely, in my opinion, from having somebody there to guide and direct me and to push me. Because there's some sessions I wake up to some mornings and I'm just like, oh God, I can't be annoyed with this. But you'll go and do it because you know you have to and you know that it's going to take me from where I am today to competing or to win competitions. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so, I mean, what was... Um... One of the things that I come across, particularly with 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 men, is that we we're kind of taught as as guys that you know we've got to you got to come plow your own field, kind of you've got to be a man of direction, you've got to know what you want, you've got to lead, you know, and and so often I sit with guys and that some people come in with the kind of coachable mindset already they're kind of sitting in front of you and they go right, you know what, the reason I'm here is because I know I can't do it on my own, I need some help. You know, and I always use the example of like a plumber. You know, I could probably do my own plumbing. I wouldn't be, it would take me a long time. I'd probably fudge it a bit, but it would get done. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I get someone else to do it very quickly who's an expert. And we, 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 off, we kind of offload that expertise in lots of other areas. But when it comes to our fitness, I think because we've got two arms, two legs, we've got bodies, we feel that we can probably do it ourselves. I mean, I sat down with a guy before the, the second lockdown and he's like, yeah, I've been doing German volume training. Yeah, it's working really, really well. But when we broke down into broke it down, it just it was evidently not working and he wasn't really doing it. And it was probably the wrong program for him. But by the end of it, I still couldn't quite because he wasn't in that mindset of what a, the value of a coach. So I mean, what what's how are you starting to kind of teach that coaching aspect to your clients are people knowing you as a thought leader in your area and that's why they're coming to you or is there a process in which you're trying to get them to think about the value of coaching that's a good question i think there's definitely an element of the two sides of that question because obviously with the reputation that i've built and the success that i've built with the people who i've coached you'll get people who come to me who do have a good level of experience, whether it be coaches or everyday athletes, as, as I like to call them, they will come with an expectation that that I do expect them to already have a baseline level of knowledge and a baseline level of understanding and a baseline level of ability. And it's my job to enhance that even further beyond what they believed possible. And on the other side of the coin, in relation to your question, People do come to us for people do come to us in a way that they do want to. You know, people wouldn't come to us if they didn't actually want to benefit themselves or to improve their, their quality of life. That just goes without saying. So they there will be an element of people who there is bluffers, there is people who don't really want to help themselves. But to be brutally honest, I've kind of weeded that out in a way that people I don't really get that type of person coming to me. And I'll be honest, if, if there is that person coming to me, I would say that it, uh, they're not my type of person I like to coach with. And I mean it in the nicest way possible. Because ultimately, I only want to work with people who, one, want to change their life for the better. Two, who you're willing to put the work in. Uh, and three, people who are, are not wanting me to hold their hand. People who are not, you know, people need to be self-motivated in a way where they have to actually put the work in themselves to get where they want to be because without that level of self-motivation or self-determination, you know, they're, they're not going to get to where they want to be at the end of the day and they're going to be banging their head off the wall. Are but, you finding that that mindset, because you see, it's a mindset thing, isn't it? And you could have someone who's a total beginner with that mindset and someone who's quite advanced. So are you getting people turning up to your studio who are like, I've never picked up a weight in my life. I've got a back problem, but I'm in the right zone. Help me. Very rarely, to be brutally honest, because most of my most of my clientele who I coach with and have coached with for the past few years are predominantly either coaches who are wanting to better their and further their knowledge as a coach in terms of their technical ability and their ability to coach better, which is a big compliment, and I take that as a big compliment. Um, also, I've found that a lot of coaches come to me because they see that I have coaches and they want to have a further and greater ability of strength and fitness. Hence why we all have coaches. And in terms of 
uh, mindset. I personally, I've never been one to kind of really go into that mindset element of, of training. I, I'm a big believer in just either have, either have the mindset because you want to do it or not. And your discipline and the fact that you have a goal in line and that should be enough for you to kind of see that that should be enough for you to stay motivated. Basically mm. there's a great, there's a great, uh, I think Paul McElroy put a great post out many years ago and it went viral about motivation being one of the last things on somebody's mind when it comes to a goal. It should be way down the bottom almost because your motivation should just become, your motivation should be just natural in a sense that, okay, you're going to wake up some days where you're not going to feel like you want to train and you're going to wake up some days you're going to feel like you want to train, but ultimately your motivation should be the fact that you're showing up every single day and you have an end goal in sight. This is this is the funny thing because like I know exactly I understand exactly what you're saying. So what might what might be happening there is so somebody who ne- necess- hasn't necessarily got the the mindset to say right I'm going to get up and train every day blah 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 like the stuff you go on about on social media. You were saying like you used to say never miss Monday. Now you're just like never miss a day because like it all matters, right? <laughs> but there's some people who just can't comprehend that. But you might not have the empathy for those people, is what is what you're saying, I think, because you've never had you've never had that mindset because you started at a young age. Yes, you don't really you don't really get it. Whereas someone like me, I didn't start until I was in my mid thirties, so I get where when people are like, "Ah, oh, you're a coach, so basically you just you do everything for me, and I just have to like you know I'll just I'll just be around over here and you'll get me the result." It's like. Because people think a coach is going to do everything for them as well. And it's like, no, a coach yes. is there. Just make sure you bloody do it. They don't yeah, do it well, for you. You've still got to take responsibility, which is a lot. The way I look at it is, is that, you know, I grew, up in, I grew up in a level of hardship. And I grew up in, a lot of my life has grew up in a level of hardship. And I've had a lot of trauma through my early years with my family and, and my young life. And... I always look to sport and exercise and fitness as, a, as an outlet. So I use that to vent my aggression, to vent my emotions. And I've never really looked at anything else as a way for that. You know, I grew up in a society where, I know you had Paul McElroy on before, and he spoke about growing up in a society where it was a, it was a war zone, technically. We grew up, <laughs> I'm, I'm very happily 10 years younger than him, and I'll always make him aware of that. Uh, <laughs> But uh, and because of that, I grew up in a different era where I didn't grow up in that war zone that he grew up in. So whenever I was in my early teens, I had two options. It was either go down the lanes of drink, drugs, uh, alcohol and drugs, or go down the lane of playing on sport. And the society that I grew up in, which is predominantly working class, I was almost like a rare person to kind of just stick to sport. So uh, because of the trauma and the hardship that I had it with my family and my, and my early teens growing up, I, I, I use sport as a means for me to kind of vent all of that. And that mindset that I had, I, okay, I do expect people to have it to a certain extent. And I do empathize with people who don't have it. And it took me a while to kind of come around to terms with that because I know people... I think I, I don't want to fall in the trap of expecting people to have the same mindset as me because ultimately I know people don't, but I do expect people to seek some sort of hardship in life because ultimately it does make you a better person and it does make you a better athlete and it does help you improve your level of strength and level of fitness because ultimately it is a reason for you to change and it, it, it is does that it, type of... There's this funny thing. I mean, the more I did research into strength training, the more I kept ending up in Belfast or in Ireland, you know, I ended up, there's so many people that seem to be at a high level of strength. And there seems to be a lot of outside the box thinking. I remember when, when we did the SMK, loads of you guys came over uh, for the weekend. And obviously it's people like Paul, everyone who's trained in his gyms, uh, you know, and, and we often think of like the Scandinavians being the Viking warriors, but, there's so much strength training going on over the over, over where you are at the moment. What do you think? Do you think it's something to do with the hardship, or is it just the you know like Liverpool back in the sixties had all those great musicians? It's just like vibing off each other. Yeah, do you yeah, think yeah. it's just that it's just like everyone's just like once you get a certain base level of a skill, 
you start getting a bit of an arms race and people try <laughs> try and do better than each other, you know? Yeah, well, I, I, you got to look at it um, in that way because obviously Belfast has notoriously been, you know, there are, it has, it has had a high amount of hardship in the 70s and 80s and the early 90s. And as I say, people, as I just say, there are people will look at two different, people will go one direction, Alcohol, drug, drugs, violence, or the leader vent their um, frustrations or their emotion to fitness. And I think the, the people who do vent go down that direction, in the right direction, in my opinion, of um, health and fitness and improving their strength and improving their endurance. There's a small minority of them, and they do invest a lot of time, effort, money into furthering their ability and furthering their, their knowledge in those areas. Hence why it's probably a small minority and those people have been so successful. So they're growing, they're growing pretty exponentially on the world stage in that regard. But like myself, you know, like Paul, for example, like there's many others in Belfast who've attended the Strong First certifications, have attended the SMK certifications. And it's no surprise that us are, we are the kind of main, you know, leaders in Ireland as such. So I take a lot of positives from that. And I would say it is because of that hardship. Um, no, I'm different. I grew up in, you know, I'm 30 years of age. I grew up in the early, um, I was just tipping on the millennial stage. So I grew up in a different time or different era than many of the people who are much more older than me, who still are to this day a lot more um, experienced in the industry than I am. So I still have a fair bit to learn in that regard, but I'm still just keeping my head down and working hard in that regard. It's interesting because I think, I think probably you're the youngest guest we've had on out of the 34. If I'm, I, I can't think of anyone younger than 30 that we've had on. So, but you're so, you know, committed and single-minded and, and uh, I don't want to use the term motivated, but, you know, kind of dedicated <laughs> and committed, you know? Um, yeah. And I think it's interesting because all the guys that you train and, you, and because you are this certain way, I think it's very true in this industry and probably in any industry, you attract people to you that are, that are kind of that, that like you and that um that 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 want to be like you and that are kind of drawn to the way that you train and the things that you do so all the kind of people that you that you share their stories on your social media and that sort of thing they're also very committed very dedicated individuals i know you have lots of people who do like the the tactical strength challenge and then go on to do certifications themselves and you've got you know rugby players and you know all these different players and things so uh i can see that your you're really attracting people to you and creating that community of like-minded people, aren't you? Different to, to the way that I might do it and, and Paul might do it and Peter might do it, but you've, you've got that niche where you're working, haven't you? And you, your people are drawn to you because of that and what you're doing. Absolutely. And I take a lot of, I take a lot of pride in that because I don't like the, <laughs> I don't like to spend my time with time wasters as such. And I think that kind of comes across in my message and, the people who I am working with and the people who I promoted as such, I like the all of it. It's kind of funny because most of the people that I coach are we're all, as you say they're very similar to me. I see myself as a bit of a I'm a bit of a glorified loner in that regard, and uh, <laughs> I the people who I the people who I coach are very similar in that they they just love their training, they use it as an outlet. You know, I have a very, I'm very busy with my business and so forth, but training is my only form of outlet. You know, I've, I still, this day, I, I don't drink. I would have the odd bottle of beer now and then, one max. Um, hands, hands on my heart, I've never taken a drug in my life. Um, I like to, you know, I just like to chill out. I'm very, very private in that regard. But the people who I'm coaching are very similar in that, and that they, they just use training as their main outlet. And I think that's been even more prevalent the past year, especially with, with the lockdown restrictions in that people have had to look at training as an only means, to, as an only way for them to vent some sort of emotion. And, and it is an outlet in that regard, because ultimately right now, with the whole situation that we're living in right now, people do have that option. And it's even it's staring them directly in the face that they can either train or they can either not. And, the way that I've trained and the way that I'm continuing to train, I've only looked to com compete and I've looked to further progress my own health and fitness the past year because I know people 
or even more so than I have, because I know people need to have some sort of leader out there who is walking the walk and talking the talk, as I say, and somebody who is actually training hard and competing hard amongst all the madness that's going on in the world. And I have seen a lot of people message me and I have seen a lot of people who would um, reach out and say, you know, fair play for being able to do that. But to me, it's just another day. It's just becoming a lot more um, evident in the world that we're living in because people are spending far more time on social media. People are probably seeing my stuff more. People are probably seeing me more. And it's good to see. I, I take a lot of pride in people coming just purely for, for myself. Um, I'm pretty old school in that regard and that the way I think and the way I um, train. Uh, I like to, um, whenever I was trying to further my knowledge and further my education, I always look back to, you know, as I call it, the yesteryear, you know, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. I read a lot of books from there and I've always um, based a lot of my own fitness and my own knowledge and my own coaching ability off the people who were successful back then because that time span of like 30 to 50 years ago when basically, you know, um, all the principles and the methods and the techniques and the true level of strength and fitness and coaching, that, those were, that was the time where it was basically all tried and tested. You know, in my opinion, it was that exact time frame that has set up everything that is successful about the strength and fitness world today, mentally and physically. And I do come across quite honest and quite blunt in some of my stuff and some of my message, hence why I think I do attract people who are very much similar to me, because in my opinion, and you guys will probably vote for this, but right now, and even more so now, there is just a high level of confusion in the modern era of fitness. Almost too much information, especially when people are trying to improve their strength and their fitness. Um, everything is just vastly polluted by commercialism. You know, people promoting the next best thing than sliced bread, which is so strange because, in my opinion, how, how do people separate, you know, how do people separate the true, the valuable information from the fraudulent and people who are incompetent? As I always say, walk the walk and talk the talk. Too many people nowadays are, are not doing, they're either they're walking, they're either training a lot and they're the best kept secret or they're talking a lot and they don't train at all. And as I always say, the best way to deal with the confusion of the modern world right now is to, what is what I done and it's how I became successful with was to look um, was to glean from the success and the clarity from the past because if you look at anybody from the 50s the 60s the 70s and the 80s there was no bullshit back then you know it was there was no social media back then it was just straight up and everyone who every sorry everybody I've spoke to everything I've read um, they've always just continually strayed to get stronger and to improve their endurance and Three variables string the mind right away. It's one, you decide on a goal. Two, you pursue that goal. Three, you achieve that goal. And no matter what the set outcome, it always takes a 360 turnaround back to what separates the best and the best. And that's ultimately strength and better endurance. And in my opinion, strength has always been the master quality uh, and improving your endurance in that regard too. Because whenever you invest time into, whenever you invest your time into pursuing the endless possibilities that strength can offer. You improve everything. You, you quite literally, you imp you're quite literally everything improves as well as your endurance. You know your quality of life. From your quality of life improves. Your athleticism improves. Your mindset improves. Your body's ability to recover improves. Everything improves whenever you seek to put yourself in hardship. Whenever you seek to put yourself through. A specific goal and I think that is starting to come across a lot in my message and even more so over the, over the past year because I've just continued to no matter what we're living in such a strange time no matter what I've just seeked training as a massive outlet and referring back to that coaching element of it I I wouldn't be where I am right now with my strength and fitness if it wasn't for my coaches because ultimately if I was if I was not gleaning off them guys I would probably be in a bad place you know we probably all would be um and most of the people who have been speaking to a lot over the past you know year they've all came to me and they've all said they said the exact same thing they have no direction they have no purpose they have no structure they have no accountability they have no real meaning with their health and fitness 
And I just throw it right back at them and say, that's your own fault. You haven't took action. It may sound very, it may sound very blunt. It it's may true, sound very it? blunt. And it may sound honest, but in my opinion, people need to be told the cold hard truth nowadays. Ultimately, people people need to be told the truth. And I think people appreciate a lot for I think people appreciate the truth and the bluntness a lot better. And I think that comes with me as a person because as I grew up, I was I was told things straight. I think it's with the Belfast thing or it's an Irish thing that you're told things straight. This is how it is. It's either, you know, it's either black or white, and you can take it as it is. And I think that's coming across in my message. It's coming across, it comes across how I coach. All the people who I do coach will will vouch for that. Um, I just tell it as it is. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing is, we all three of us wanted to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> you go first, Pete. You go first, oh, Pete. Well, thank you. No, it's funny because, like, one thing you said was trying to get through all the crap that's out there in the industry as well, which is exactly what this podcast tries to do. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> Subscribe. Um, it's, one of those things, it's like we're trying to give over information to people, to people who don't necessarily yeah. know what to look for and say, you know, not like this is the way to do it, but here's some ideas and here's some people to, who you want to listen to because they know what they're talking about. Yeah. James. But uh, guys are yeah, sorry, you know, this way, you know. Yeah, no, but it's I find it can't quite refresh it because I'm 30 and majority of my clientele are anywhere between 25 and 40 years of age. So and many of the coaches who I coach are actually younger than me. So it's refreshing to see that my message is translating and it's people are actually taking it on board and it's starting to come out because you know yourselves social media i'm guessing whenever you guys were 30 social media wasn't that wasn't as prevalent and right now there's not it didn't sorry, exist when i was like this <laughs> what are you saying <laughs> I'm, I'm older than you <laughs> well, it, you know, it's, it's so strange because um whenever i get in the, whenever i get into, into the industry you know facebook was there um, twitter was there instagram was there and everything was just driven by social media and like i said with with social media and with the, the amount of information that everybody can access right now you know yourselves the more information you have the more confusion it leads to and ultimately too much information just has people thinking in fifty thousand different angles where it's it's, it's I, I don't think it's necessarily too much information as well i think i mean that that's a major thing but there is misinformation out there that people will sell stuff yes. on the back of they'll blatantly put out misinformation and there's there's very little um very little come back. there's some people on instagram whatever uh, whatever who've been fined and sued and and all of that but it's it, it, compared to the amount of people who are out there doing it it's very 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 small percentage so there's people out there who are just making millions out of flogging crack to people and they know that message, they don't, they don't believe it, they don't live by it, and they know it's not necessarily true, but they've got to do it anyway because they've, they've built that they've built that into their social media so they can't get out of it anymore. Mm. It's bonkers. Well, it comes down to two things. It comes down to two things, commercialism and capitalism. You know, commercialism is just driven by the amount of stuff that people are putting out in information ways on social media and advertising, and then on top of that, people are just making a shit ton of money. You know, but you can't fault them for making money. Of- that's all well and good if you're selling a product. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're selling a product, right, people can buy it, yes. that's fine. But when you're dealing with people's health, it's a that's that's the huge problem that I find. When you're dealing with people's health, it can cause huge yeah. problems and there's no repercussions. You know, you can ruin someone's life yeah, by giving them the wrong advice. Mm. Absolutely. And the way I look at it is also, I think people in general aren't stupid. People aren't when people spend money into things that they are they are gonna you know you you buy cheap you buy twice as i like to say or if you don't spend the money you're not going to get quality ultimately people will make mistakes where they where they will spend money and their investment won't match the outcome ultimately when it comes to investing a coach but i think i think people are starting to see the light and i think people will you will people will spend money on certain coaches and people will eventually finish a specific program or finish a specific product and they will 
ultimately see the light at the end of the tunnel, whether it be whether it be success or not. But mm. I, it just boils down to this, you know, people aren't stupid. People will see the truth for what it actually is. And I think those coaches out there, I'm not going to start belittling people. It's not my form, but um, ultimately, I think the lifespan of those coaches who are promoting, who are just out there for the money, it's not their lifespan in the industry is going to be be very, 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 very short. You know, you got to look at all the top coaches in the world right now, and they've been around for many, 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 many years. And why is that? It's it's a results driven business. Mm. You know, so you know, you look at the likes of Paul McRoy, you look to, you look at the likes of Pavel, you look at the likes of Dan John. Why are they in the in the industry right now is for so long it's because they've had so many, many results. And the biggest flaw, in my opinion, with the industry right now is that you guys know yourselves, there's endless amounts of people coming coming into the industry on a daily basis. There's new coaches being churned out week by week. And I think the biggest flaw within the industry right now is that people are focusing too much on becoming good at business rather than becoming good at being an actual coach. Because yeah. ultimately... Okay, yes, business is a massive part of you being a success, ultimately in your own business. But if you can't teach somebody how to hinge, if you can't teach somebody how to squat, you're not going to get the results you're after. And then it goes back to what I said a few minutes ago. People aren't stupid. People will see the light at the end of the tunnel. And my best advice for anybody coming in and coming into the industry right now is to get good at a coach, get good at being a coach, get good at being a coach and let the business side of things take off. No, come after. Um, you know, it's only been the past year that I've took on a business mentor and I've been in the industry now for the past 10 years, you know, so most of my success has been based on um, just helping people improve their own quality of fitness and through referrals. So it's been, it's been interesting in that regard. I think we could distill this down. I mean, it's one thing that, one thing that you have to bring as a client is a desire to change and a desire to do the work. But unless you're willing to, the, the only shortcut in the industry, and I think that you can you can get as a client, is to invest in someone else's knowledge, Absolutely. because because otherwise you're going to have to spend. I mean, I would have to spend many 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 years acquiring Paul McElroy's knowledge, or I can just you know impart some cash. <laughs> bring my a game in bring my a game in terms of wanting to achieve the goal and then letting his programming do the work you okay. know i mean i have to show up i have to believe it i have to eat according to the program i have to do the reps but you know i can probably work out the best route myself but it might take me 10 years i don't need to do that with paul you know and that's why they're coming to you it's like it is a shortcut using a coach and it's the best kind of shortcut because you also educate yourself in the process and you may fast track your own educational process and you may make better choices you become a better coach or better individual absolutely it's uh you know my coaching knowledge hasn't you know well, my coaching knowledge has improved massively from the past nearly six years that i've been with paul McElroy as as my own coach and i use a lot of his principles that his methods alongside many others as well and have my own spin on it and you know yourself you've been you you're coached by qualms it's so so simple and it's so so I, I don't mean to undermine it in that way um he'd probably hate me for saying that but the way he programs is different level but it's also quite simple and I've, yeah I, yeah i'm not trying to contradict that in a way but well, you 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 re, you get you get the plan through, and you go. Oh, of course, it's that. You, it, it, when you look at it, you go, I'll "Yeah, of course." It's fine. I yeah, try and guess what it's going to be, and I'm usually right. I'm like, usually well, right. I'll just do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> but then, but then suddenly he'll change the direction a little bit, yeah. and you yeah. didn't expect him to go. You expected him to go right, and he went left. Yep. And and that's the interesting thing. And also, he expects a video from me, and yeah. he expects me to show up, and. He also won't, like I said earlier, take any excuses. I mean, I tried to convince him my legs were too long at one point, you know, and that's why I wasn't deadlifting very well. Um, and I'm, I'm coming up with some other ones. I'm working on them. Um, but today he had me doing 25 minutes of snatches, which, you know, I didn't 
I didn't mind. I, I could do it. I mean, if I look back in the past, I mean, it wasn't 25 minutes in one go. I mean, that would kill me. There was there was rest <laughs> in between. But, um, you know, it was after jerks. It was after squats. And um, the volume of training I'm doing now, I would never envis envisage for myself. Yes. You know, I wouldn't have thought that I had the capacity for it, you know. Yeah. Um, I think it refers back a fair bit to what we were speaking about earlier there in relation to people are attracted by people. But... Me and Paul are grew up in the basically the same place. We grew up in West Belfast. It's funny, obviously everything's separated by north, south, east, and west. But if you've come to Belfast, literally, if you go to the north Belfast, west Belfast, um, the east and the south, it's literally go, it's literally like going into four di different areas completely. Um, but we're you know me and Paul grew up basically in the same community um, and. I, I, I followed him for many years. Um, not, that sounds creepy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, read, I read a lot about him and I knew, I watched a lot of his stuff on YouTube, but it was funny how we kind of, how we kind of crossed paths and how we initially um, started coaching uh, or how I got in the GS. It was back in 2015 and I was basically at a crossroads with my running and I was almost just falling out of love with it. I got to this point where I was, I just didn't like what I was doing anymore. I knew there was something else that I had to, I just didn't like it anymore what I was doing. I was running just for the sake of running. I was, I had no drive, I had no path. As I always say, I had no purpose with it. I was just running for the sake of running. Probably very similar to the way people nowadays are just training for the sake of training. Um, and I always knew of Paul McElroy, but at the time I was, um, coaching alongside uh, a guy called Paul Murray, who actually gave me who, who actually gave me my first opportunity as a Catabell coach, and Paul Murray was at the time part of a very small group of people who were basically, as I like to say, Paul McElroy's like um, like guinea pigs, because at the time Paul McElroy brought out uh, was starting his own like Catabell club. And he wanted to take basically take people from having a very baseline knowledge of kettlebells to competing on the world stage. And that was, so there was, this, there was this one day where I was in the gym and I was training, I was doing hard state kettlebell snatches. And in the corner of my eye, I seen the five guys going in the, like the depths of hell with a 16 kilo kettlebell doing this GS training that Paul had prescribed to them. But I, and I was looking at them going like, and these guys were like 85, 90, 100 kilo guys. And they were being tortured by a 16 kilo kettlebell. And I was looking at them going like, I could do that, no problem. But it was my stubbornness and my blunt organs to be like, no, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to give this a go. And Paul Murray, funny enough, he says to me, you should give this a rattle. You know, with your endurance background, with your ability with your technical ability, with your hard style, and with your mindset, and with your determination, you would be a world champion. And I was just like, I, I laughed it off, you know, eating the words now at the minute, like, um, but, so I actually messaged Paul McElroy one day, and I says, I've never spoken to him before, Paul, I've never spoken to him before, and I messaged him saying, I want to be a part of this. And he gave me a shot. Um, six months later, I was competing on the world stage in Dublin. Um, in the in the world championships and we haven't looked back since but i think me and paul work we work very very well together because we're both of the same mindset you two guys are coached by him he takes no shite um he expects he just expects you to do the work and if you do the work you'll see the success and you'll see you'll see the results and he he requires you to be self-motivated he requires you to be to be self-disciplined and that's exactly the way i require the people who i coach so We'll work hand in hand and as i say it kind of falls down to a very 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 basic human standard and that is something that my parents always instilled in me as a child and that was treat people the way you would like to be treated and as what i say is, is coach people the way you would like to be coached so whenever i had this opportunity to be coached by in my opinion right now one of the top level strength and conditioning coaches on the planet you know how could I, it would almost be massively disrespectful if I didn't actually show up every single day and if I didn't put the work in 
if I didn't stay accountable to him, if I didn't stay on the path that he had me on, it would be a massive disservice to not only myself, but to him and a massive unjust to him as well. So now that goes for many of the other coaches I have. Um, so that's why I think me and Paul work hand in hand. We're both, we're both cut from the same cloth. We both have the same um, mindset of we're just going to keep going here until you know, non-stop. So I think that's probably one of our main reasons why we've done so good over the past number of years. Hmm. I think one of the... Sorry, go on, Carry on, carry on, James. Oh, I was just going to say, I think one of the lessons really from, from what you've said uh, and from a lot of the guests that we've had on before is that, and you, you all mentioned there with Paul McElroy's programming, it's kind of deceptively simple. You know, you kind of, it almost, it's simple, but it's all the work and the years of, of learning behind it that's let him get make it that simple and it's like with with Dan John all of his stuff is is so simple but it's it's all of the stuff that he's cut away in the process to kind of reveal that sort of simplicity and and what what you said Paul a little bit earlier about well I think you've all said it the the kind of confusion uh in the industry if you like and the confusion of the amount of content and the amount of information out there and the amount of conflicting information that people really want to one of the benefits of a coach is someone who can strip away all that confusion and actually make something really clear and simple and actionable and just a simple, you know, simple program. Just forget about all this noise, all this stuff going on over here. Keep it simple, you know, and that's like you say, uh, Finn, going back to the training in the, you know, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, before all this noise was around, people knew how to get the results and it was simple. But the problem is, I think that people constantly want to find something new to sell, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, this kind of reinventing the wheel and just putting a slightly different spin on it to kind of make it sexy and make it new when really everything anyone needs to know about how to get strong has already been done in the world, hasn't it? No one's going to create something that's better than, you know, a deadlift or a squat or a press or a kettlebell swing or, or you know, whatever, you know. It's all there for us, isn't it? It People are just looking at that magic gold dust, aren't they really? And you hit the nail on the head there where ultimately, as I always say, one, if you do the basic kettlebell lifts, the basic power lifts and the basic body weight movements, you're basically going to be where you want to be in life and, and in your health and fitness goals in that regard. But I'll stop you. I want to make a point very clear here about what you say is about Paul McNoy's programming being simple. Um, don't confuse simple with being easy. Because, <laughs> but it's, yeah. No, 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 no. Totally is, different. Yeah, totally different. Any, yeah. It is absolutely, it is anything but easy because... It's horrific at times. Yeah, yeah. I, I have joked. I have joked many times over about the workout. I'll never forget this one session I done back in July 2017. I'll never forget this. So Paul had this really weird goal. I was it was a goal of mine as well to complete a hundred reps back squat with a hundred kilo. Um, now I have the squat ability to do that. Um, not right now, ultimately, but you know, is this I, in one go? In one go, yeah. I have the ability to do it. It's been done. It's been done numerous times, but. I've joked about this workout I done back in July, and it was here. Here it is. So, and just be cautious of this. So if anybody's listening, don't do this randomly one day because you'll not walk for about six children. Years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I just say everything Finn is about to say is now to do with the Health Oddity podcast. We <laughs> don't stand by any of it. So, so these are the opinions of the. <laughs> it's, like the uh, it's like you get on the wrestling, the WWE. Don't try this at home. Don't try this at home. Um, so to be honest, you know, here's a session I done. It was ten squats at hundred kilo, fifteen squats at ninety five kilo, twenty squats at ninety kilo. It was seven sets of that. It was three hundred and fifteen reps total, thirty thousand kilo. So. I'll repeat that again. 10 squats at 100 kilo rest, 15 squats at 95 kilo rest, 20 squats at 90 kilo, seven sets of that. And here's the truth, mentally and physically, I'm still recovering. Um, <laughs> well, the thing is that I get is, is you get the number, you get the thing through and you suddenly start doing some mental calculations of where this is going to take you. Exactly. And, and you go, ah, so we're going up to 10 sets of 10 in ladders from one that's 300, <laughs> you know, or something like, I remember what, doing what? 200 pull-ups in a session, you know, 
Well, tell me what I love about it. What I love about it is I saw Finn post something the other day. So you did your one day. You did like a kettlebell workshop, didn't you, for a day last week? Didn't you? Have you got me? Yes. Hello? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you did that. Oh, yes, if yes. You had like a steady amount of pull-ups to do that day. So you did half of them in the morning. You did like sixty in the morning, yeah. in the evening. And I did something similar on Saturday. I had a look. I had stuff to do, and I'm like, oh, that'll take about an hour. And it, and it doesn't, because you're like, well, I need oh, to oh. in between. So I ended up finishing off my session doing push-ups in, on the kitchen floor while I was grilling some bacon, doing pull-ups, like, you know, doing my push-ups and then my pull-ups and then coming back and then flipping it over and then frying some eggs and then going back out and doing it again. So, like, it's it's one of those things, like you say, the, the mentality of, like, I've got to get this done. Yeah. But then if you can't fit it in, it's like, no, I can. There's some way I can do it. There's a way I'll be able to fit it in. And at the beginning of lockdown, you said that as well. You were like, pick a space at home yes. and you can call your workout space and use it. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but I think that refers to, um, there's a few points here I want to point on, and that falls, it falls back on what I like to call the meat and potatoes. In that if you look at any classic dinner, any classic meal, it all forms around a portion of meat and a portion of carbohydrates. Now, how that refers to programming, if I told you what I've done, what I have done over the past six years to get me to where I am on a world level of kettlebell sport, I have back squatted, I've deadlift, I've bench pressed, and I've milled high pressed. Kettlebell ways, it's been kettlebell jerk and kettlebell snatch, pull-ups, uh, what else? Maybe some ab wheels, maybe some hanging knee raises. Like 10, maybe 10 things max exercise ways that have taken me to where I am with my current level of strength and fitness. And ultimately, there's a lot of information you have to gain from that because people are seeking continually to um, seek that magic dust or that, or that gold gold dust in that regard. And really, um, that's, all, that's all people really need to have it's a very small amount of exercise listen and i and that's the way i program with people too and it's a big eye opener for many for many coaches who i train um that they come to me and they look at their program there's maybe four exercises on it for that day and they're like okay that looks simple but it's actually not easy and they realize the true value of of actual structured programming whenever they get it and the basics the basics work and the and the the reason as i say the reason the best of the best is because they're better at the basics than anybody else um, now, in relation to what you say there about um, the, 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 the team that people have, I was actually on a call earlier with, with a girl who, um, who has signed up, with, who's signed up with me as a coach, um, to me the culture, but um, the big question I asked her, and I asked everybody this whenever they sign up with me, is all I ask you is to commit to maybe 45 to 60 minutes per day, four to six days a week, and ultimately... See if you can't invest that amount of time and effort over a course of a week and over a course of a day, you're gonna you're banging your head directly off a wall. You're not gonna get to where you want to be with your health and fitness. And I don't care what anybody says. If you haven't got that time to commit um, on a daily basis, you're not you're not gonna get to where you want to be. And that's the straight up answer that I say to people. Um, and forever, it, it does relate back to a couple of weeks back when when I was doing that workshop. I looked at my program that day and I had eight sets of one to five pull ups, and I was like. I'm not going to be able to do this in one go because my arms, my arms are so long. It takes me about an hour to do one pull up the length of my arm and the distance I'm traveling. So, uh, <laughs> so I've been down in the morning time and done a few sets in the morning and done a few sets at night, um, which is probably one of the beauties of, of that type of program. And it, it is very sub maximal and it can be done at any given moment throughout the course of the day, just as long as I get my sessions done. Um, well, I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons I started working with. Chris, who we've Chris. had on back about, Chris. was it last year or beginning of this year? Um, because one thing that that programming does do because of the, the sheer consistency is you suddenly realize, and you have to make a decision, is that if you want to hit your goal, then you've got to recover as well as you train. Absolutely. Because, because if you don't, and particularly me, I'm like a 41-year-old guy, um, you know, I, I I, I think I recover pretty well, but 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 I wasn't recovering when I was I was getting to that point where I made a transition from doing just normal training, just getting a bit stronger, because I suddenly realized how weak I was, to suddenly doing more GS specific stuff. And and for those people listening, I, I might tell people exactly what GS sport is, just so people know exactly what 
for your yes. done and then why it's such an achievement to become a world champion um, is that I suddenly realized that the weekends I was just crashing and burning and I was just totally knackered and I needed to eat better and feed that because the kind of volume you're talking about you know it needs it needs to have a recovered body to go into it consistently so it is within your comfort zone so you started working with the nutritionist to make those changes in your own life as well didn't you absolutely yes i've worked with a few nutritionists in the past uh a guy called um the first nutritionist that i worked with was a guy called potty joe black from belfast he was he was brilliant he really opened my eyes to what nutrition um is because I, I always, I always, I personally always found nutrition very boring. I think I grew up where I was just eating when, when I wanted, what I wanted, basically. Um, but I did, I did appreciate the true value of what nutrition brings to your overall ability to perform on a daily basis. Um, the main reason I initially started with him was because I was moving up. I wanted to actually put weight on. So I was trying to build muscle and build mass. At the time when I first started, I was like 69, 68, 69 kg or so. And I got myself up to like 75 in the space of a few months. But it was healthy. It was a healthy increase. It wasn't like I just put on a load. You know yourself, you could take time off training and very easily put six kilo on. <laughs> but is it going to be healthy? Um, probably not. But, uh, <laughs> but it was more or less last year whenever I was moving up to the pro level of competing in GS and I I just needed that accountability. I needed that direction and I needed somebody to take it off my hands uh, I, because personally, I work best from basically just being told what to do. So I go and do this, do it at this time and just get it done. And that's how, that's how I've always worked. It's kind of how I'm programmed to do. So it worked best for me. So I worked with a guy called Chris Lowe last year and he just opened my eyes on nutrition, um, timing, the timing of nutrition, on your week in terms of before your training sessions, after your training sessions, um, the basic breakdowns of carbs, proteins, and fats. Um, the big thing for me was that even though I had succeeded already quite, quite well in GS in terms of the competition, but my competition day nutrition was terrible. I think I was just fueled on adrenaline, to be brutally honest, fueled on adrenaline, fueled on coffee. Um, fueled on rice cakes and uh, and bananas, but I was I just knew that I was leaving so much reps and so much potential out there on the platform that I needed something else. And the big takeaway from him was the competition day, uh, nutrition and the recovery of nutrition. Now you guys know yourselves. Nutrition comes in in, in many many different forms. Um, it comes in nutrition. Uh, sorry, recovery comes in many forms. You know, nutrition, sleep, uh, peer to raise recovery, or basic deal weeks in training, uh, massage, sports therapy, things like that. But I always knew that basically the great, the, I always had that uh, mindset or that ability to know that the greatest, the greatest strength and performance gains can only be achieved when periods of hard training are alternated with periods periods of easier training and and utilizing the correct recovery methods and that's through nutrition through sleep through massage and i just i just knew that um that working with a nutritionist would step it up we step it up and that's taking me to the next level and it's changed my whole outlook outlook on nutrition basically the past year mm. so just just quickly how much rest do you get because you look at your profile, your social media profile, social media, which wasn't around when we were kids, but there you go, your social media profile, and it looks like you're just at it all the time, right? It, do, it, it just does, doesn't it? But how much rest do you actually get? Because this is what people think, like, oh, I'm, I want to train, I want to get this, I've got to, like, put hours and hours and hours in. You know, how long is your average training session, and how, how much rest do you get during the day? Not like, and I mean, I don't mean, like, you know, sitting down doing now because you've obviously got a business to run and all that. But how many how many hours a day are you not training and focusing on recovery? Do you know what I mean? So my basic, I would train six days a week, um, three days kettlebell, three days barbell. My my barbell days are undoubtedly the longest days. Where my kettlebell days are pretty competition specific in that right now I'm competing in pentathlon, which is basically. Um, for people who don't know what that is, it's 
it's six minutes of five different exercises with a five minute recovery. So I'll complete six minutes of cleans, five minutes recovery, six minutes of clean and press, five minutes recovery, six minutes of jerk, five minutes recovery, six minutes of half snatch, five minutes recovery, six minutes of push press. So that's a competition set. It was created by oh, Valerie oh, Valerenko. <laughs> but not with like a six kilo weight, is it? It's like with <laughs> the weight you're going to be using in the competition. So in the competition, I would use the beauty of that is that I can use five different weights um, with each weight. Um, so for example, if I use a 40 kilo, if I use a 40 kilo for every rep, I would achieve a certain amount of points. So I think a 40 kilo is for every rep is four points, where if I use a 24, it's like 1.5 points, just for example. But um, my last competition where I won the worlds in that, I used a 40 kg for the cleans. I used a 28 for the clean and press. I used a 30 for the jerk, a 30 for the half snatch, and a 28 for the push press. Um, but referring back to uh, Peter's question, uh, my training uh, barbell days, they usually last about two hours, two and a half hours. Uh, my competition day, my kettlebell days, they normally last about an hour and 15, hour and a half max. And it's not like I'm messing about those <laughs> during that time frame. It's quite... It's quite hard. Uh, I think my body's just adapted to working for that amount of time now. My body, it's not like I'm going from basically doing nothing to doing something all of a sudden where your body's going to break down. You know, for example, if I, if I went out and ran for two hours, I'd probably not be able to walk for next week. Um, yeah. But my body has just hardened and my body has just toughened to training for that amount of time um, and has done for the past number of years. Recovery ways, uh, I, I put away some amount of calories, to be brutally honest. Um, I love food. I, on my downtime, I, my downtime is basically at nighttime, I have a cutoff. I stop doing all the work on my, on my business. I stop basically being on social media around about 7 or 8 p.m. And that's where I just chill. I'd watch Netflix. I'd watch um, a film with my girlfriend, Kiva. Um, I sleep like an absolute legend, as I like to say. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think the beauty is, I think you have to remember this also. I'm 30 years of age. I have no kids. Uh, I just have my girlfriend. We have a house. And, uh, you know, she's very supportive of everything I do. And she trains herself. So recovery just comes for me in a way where I just kind of take it whenever I can, basically. Um, And I like to, you know, I like to chill out, watch football. I like to um, drink coffee. I like to chill out in coffee shops. I'm very easy. I'm I'm a bit of a um I'm very easily led. I don't I don't like high high end lifestyle around any kind. I'm not all about go, 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 go. I just I'm just very chilled out. As I like to call myself, I'm a glorified loner. Once I train, <laughs> once I train, I come back and I chill out, I eat, I do some work on my laptop, I watch some TV and I repeat that process on a daily basis. And really that's it. There's no magic ingredient. Same, same as me, but the, the reason why I asked that question is because, like, listener, like some of the listeners and people who I've spoke to, the thing they need to train for, you know, like an hour a day, six days a week is a lot for yeah. most people. Um, especially, like you say, if you're running and stuff like that, it's like lots of impact, lots of pounding, what have you. There's nothing wrong with that if you can do it. But if you're in your 40s and 50s and what have you, it's going to, you know, there's going to be things happen. And... And, and, and so, like, people, like, look at that. You might be, like, you say, an hour and a half a day, three days a week, and two and a half hours or whatever. So people might look and think they need to do an hour and a half a day or two hours a day or whatever. But that's for an elite-level athlete. You're a world champion, right? And you, you know, that's to become yeah. you, which is yeah, yeah. bonkers. You know, it's so that's awesome. like that. If that's what you want, then fair enough. But if people think they need to work out two hours two hours a day, you know, that's, that's the, the kind of... Um, that's the kind of goal you're looking at, isn't it? So half an hour a day, 45 minutes a day, three, four days a week is going to get most people to where they want to be, especially if they're doing nothing at the moment as well. So it's just trying to, I find I try to rein people in because that because they think they need to do too much, which stops them doing anything. And it's oh. like, right, well, just get started by doing a small amount. Like we say, go for a 10 minute walk or whatever, all of that. Um, so that's the reason why I asked the question, just to try and get across Yeah. the like exactly what you have to go through to be elite and then just come and then just like work it back from there and go, well, I don't want to be elite. I want to be somewhere like, 
you know, ten percent of the way there would do me. Okay, do ten percent of the training. <laughs> I saw Gio. Sorry, Finn. I was just going to say I saw Gio the other day, and when I see him, we we occasionally say, "God, did you see Finn's workout yesterday?" And you, you did one. You did like a, I think it was ten sets of five deadlifts, at about one hundred and thirty. Ten yeah. sets of five back squats at a hundred or something like this, and then ten sets of five like overhead press, I think it was. Yeah, and we yeah. were like, God, how long must he be training for? I said, I said to Paul, after we did the podcast, that's when I, I said to him, I was like, I want um, because he got in touch with me anyway on, on Instagram and said, like, you know, I can help you out. And I was so anyway. And I said, Oh yeah, because I am like I know Finn, you know, and you've been training him since 2015. I met you at the uh, level two in 2015, I think. Level two. And was, um, that was with Dan John. That was great. That. But I said to Paul, I was like, he was a skinny little kid. <laughs> he was a skinny little 25 year old kid. Right. <laughs> and I said, and you've been training him ever since then. I'm watching him now. And it's it just like, I'm like, well, Jesus, why can't I do that? So I was like, right, you're going to be my coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, yes, it all, it, it all just goes back to where we're basically. You've, you've had Dan John on the programme. He just says, stick to the programme and show up every single day. Yeah. And if you were to ask Paul, if you were to ask Paul, what stands, what makes me, like me in this regard, what makes me be where I am with my strength and fitness, I would probably, he, I would probably put a million dollars on it. He would say the fact that he shows up every day and the fact that he sticks to the programme. And I must be one of the weirdest people. I think it's probably my OCD in that everything that Paul does, sorry, everything that Paul says, tells me to do, I do, literally. Um, and there's really no secret or, secret ingredient around that. Um, it's just, he rates me out a program and I do it every single day. And uh, really, that's just it. Um, you just, uh, you follow the damn instructions, as they say. You just follow the, the instructions. instructions, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, Another great quote that, that Dan John says one time was plan the hunt, hunt and assess the hunt. And in my opinion, people spend too often plan it and then never actually do the hunt or assess it after. But just following through on that has been the big, big, big plus for me. But uh, it's been a big lesson for me the past number of years. I think, I think I'm finding that my body is starting to, I think I have the skill level there. I don't feel like I need to really train as hard and as really as aggressive I did maybe five maybe three four years ago the skill levels are um I can so it's just about maybe just sharpening the blade every so often mm. and refining the just tapping into the endurance side of it and just building it very specific to come into a competition so, so I'm aware like, of it's I'm like, aware it's of, like Ryan it'd be like Ryan Giggs wouldn't it because I know you're a man you fan aren't you <laughs> it'd be like Ryan Giggs like as he got older you know what I mean you stop running around as much and you start yes. like spreading the ball a bit and all that sort of stuff. That's what you're talking about. And I know nothing about football. So that's, that's my knowledge out of the way on that. I was just going to say, I'm aware, I'm aware of the time and things, but I was just going to ask you, Finn, what's, uh, what's next for you? What's the next kind of, um, on, a, on a personal level, competition sort of level and that sort of thing, what are, you, what are you working towards at the moment? Have you got something on the horizon? Yes, well, I have a few goals with the fitness. I'm... Short term, I'm competing in the European Champions, European Championships here in like five weeks time. And the big one for me is the Worlds in November. That's the way I have been programmed for the past number of years. There's a look at your year, three, three main you know, separations or three main targets, the National Championships, the European Championships and the World Championships. Is that going to be in biath biathlon? No, well, I'm competing... It's a funny thing, to be honest, you say that, uh, Paul, because last year my, I, I've competed in biathlon for the past five years and my body has, I think, I think the, the poundage and the amount of volume that I've done over the past five years has eventually caught up me a wee fair bit. And last year, around um, June, July, August, September, I just got injury after injury after injury. And they weren't, just, they weren't niggles, they were proper heavy duty soft tissue injuries and I just think the sheer volume and the sheer amount of workload that I've done with the jerk and the snatch has eventually caught up in me especially with the double bell work it's so much more demanding than single bell work um well, that's it I mean it's just yeah. worth telling everyone what 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 jerk and snatch is so the jerk is a 10 minute set where you don't put the bells down there's two kettlebells 
I don't know if you're competing with the 232s, but people compete with 28s, 26s, 24s, whatever. But professionals at 32, 232 kilo kettlebells, throwing them overhead using the power from your hips, both yeah. arms overhead. And then the snatch is a 10 minute set again, but with uh, a single kettlebell, you know, the kettlebell snatch, uh, five minutes with one hand, and then five minutes with the other. And you've got to obviously do as many reps as you can within that time period. Yes, yes. So, um, like, so I competed in biathlon for like five years, and then um, last year was kind of like uh, it was kind of like deja vu all over again. Whenever I first entered into kettlebell sport, because with all the injuries that I got last year, I was almost questioning what I was doing, and I was at that crossroads again. I was at that crossroads again where I was going. I'm going to do something else here. I'm going to move away from this. I was actually ready to quit the sport altogether. I was ready to just kind of get pack it all in and just continue to train, but not actually compete. Almost very similar to whenever I first started in kettlebell sport, where I was at that crossroads with running. I was, I was either you go one way or you go the other. And I entered in the kettlebell sport. But last year, uh, I had a few very bad injuries. You know what? I tore my right hamstring. I had a minor, I had a minor strain in one of my vertebrae, my back. Um, I uh, I tore one of my intercostal muscles, and this all came down in the space of like four months. So it was one thing after another. And you know, when you're injured, you kind of go into like a level of depression. You're because you're so used to training all the time. When you go into injury, you start thinking about things. You're like, you're, you just it opens up different channels in your head where you're going like, what the fuck am I doing here? Really, it's just. Does the risk outweigh the reward or whatever? So I was at those crossroads and I just realized that all of my injuries stemmed from doing double bell work. Um, not directly, but I think that was one of the main causes of it. Um, so I was at those crossroads where I can either continue to train and compete in kettlebell sport or just continue to train and not compete at all. So the pentathlon world championships were in November. So I was just coming back from injury and pentathlon is single bell work. And you know yourself, single bell work is so much more easier than double bell work. Um, and it's, it was multi-switch. So I was just like, I need to find the enjoyment factor again. I need to, I need to find the love again in, in kettlebell sport. Um, because ultimately, if you haven't got that love or that joy or that enjoyment factor of your training, especially when you're doing kettlebell sport, which is, which is hell, to be brutally honest, um, some days I was going like, what am I doing here? How am I enjoying this? But I needed to find that again. I needed to find that love again. So hence why I got into pentathlon. Um, but I competed in the, in the pentathlon, won, won the world championships in that, uh, won a set that has total in all weight classes, but it was a, it, it was an unofficial world record. So my goal this year is to, comp the reason it was an unofficial world record was because it was online. It wasn't in person. So fingers crossed that they have the in-person competition in the World Championships this year. So my goal is to go and set the official world record um, at my weight class. And yeah, that, that's my main goal this year, basically. Can I, can I just say, just for everyone listening, how ridiculous that is, by the way, that you, you it, across all weight classes, you, yes. you, you lifted more than everybody. So everyone heavier than you and what have you, like, that's just bonkers. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there were some big guys, that, you know, there were guys who were, um, the weight classes were 65 to 74 and then 75 to like 84 kilo. And then I think 84 plus. So, <laughs> um, uh, so I think there was just um, such a wide range of people there. Now, obviously you can be, obviously there, there are people who are heavier than me who were competing that weren't at my level ultimately, but there were some really high level competitive athletes who were um, renowned for their ability in, in that discipline, which has been tough long. But I just walked in and just gave it my all and just walked out again, champion. So it was kind of, <laughs> but, uh, um, but that just comes down you to like- You were on your own as well, right? So you were just on your own in the gym doing it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had my brother there, my brother was kind of relaxed. There's not even like a support with you or a crowd or whatever, is it? It's yeah. just. I found that so hard. I think that was the other thing that I found really hard, to be brutally honest, was, you know yourself when you compete, when you go to the when you go to the competitions, especially on world level, there is there is there's thousands of people there. You know, thousands to two thousand people there watching, 
Um, and you, th you, you, you thrive on that. You, you get a lot more energy. You get, you get a buzz. You know, it just gives you that extra level of adrenaline, that push. But it was so strange competing, um, competing in my gym. Like I got up in the morning from my house. I drove down to my gym. I recorded my set and put it in. It was just so weird. Uh, <laughs> and I had my brother there training. Um, I had, sorry, my brother was our train. He was counting my reps. Compare that to when you go to a competition, you know, you have the athlete check in a few days before, you have the weigh in a few days before. Um, you have the whole warm up area when you go to competitions. You have the whole, like, you have a judge there judging your set. You have a head judge who's adjudicating the whole. The whole flight and such of like when you're competing, um, you have the after balls off whenever you've walked away and people are congratulating you and people are talking. You have the community element. Um, yeah, it's just it's just been strange, but I think that was one of the reasons. Another reason why I was ready to throw the towel in and ready to throw the head in because I thrive on that competition side of things where you go to that where you're you're going away to somewhere where. Right now, I was just waking up in the morning in my own house and going down to the gym to compete on a world level. It was strange, strange. <laughs> well, it's probably a good time to, to end the, uh, the chat. Look, I mean, that was a really, really insightful. It's kind of gone in some funny old directions, actually, which we didn't really expect for, for this. So it's, um, uh, it's been really fascinating for me because obviously I'm really interested in the sport that you do and, um, and your kind of experience. So it's been lovely to hear that, but also... I think from anyone else who's who's listening to this, just getting to understand the value of the coach and also understanding the mindset that you need to bring to the table in order to really achieve your, your goals. I mean, I was having a chat with my wife this morning about, about she, she's done some courses with Tony Robbins and things like that. And, and one of the questions apparently Tony Robbins gets asked is, you know, you like this all the time. And um, well, he's like, it's a silly question because of course he is. It's not like he goes on stage and he's like, it was hyped up and then he sits back and just eats a bag of, crisps and, and 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 watches netflix all day you know you're obviously once you've made a commitment to that it just becomes you and it becomes part of your being and and that's a very powerful kind of message out there it's just saying you actually have total control over this result but you've got to kind of want it and you've also got to kind of be adult about the process and say you know do i actually want it if i don't then just you know make peace with it but otherwise if i am let's just commit and then just find the people to support you and obviously you're doing that for your clients as well so um, how can people find out about you? How can they kind of get to know you? Are you looking for clients at the moment? You know, tell um, people. Well, right now, I, um, I don't want to find me. You know, you can find me on my social media platforms um, at Thimbar3 by original uh, and uh, on Facebook and whatever else. Um, I'm not always the type of person to go and seek new clients. I have um, grown my online business quite beyond my belief the past year because ultimately it's been the only form of coaching truth truth be told uh, and when my gym opens up again hopefully in the next few weeks um after the lockdown i'll be i'll be very busy but uh no um if somebody's interested in um, improving their strength and their fitness and their health through the kettlebell through the barbell through body weight training i've got the results and i've got the people there to back up um what i do so yeah so Jay, James, do you have any other um, anything else you want to finish with? No, I was just going to say. Obviously, I think I think the first time I ever met Finn was did you did you do the SFG one when Dan John did it in Harlow? Did you do I remember you being there? Yeah, it was 2014. Uh, was it? Yeah, so I think that's the first time I met you back I think in so, 2014. Yeah, 2014. So I just want to say that you know, obviously, over the last sort of uh, well, what's that six seven years time, it's been great to. To obviously get to know you more and to see you see your business kind of you know launch and grow and develop and and then you as a coach you know grow and develop and obviously what you've done you know athletically yourself with your own uh sort of competition career and stuff's been fantastic so it's, it's just been really good to spend some time with you uh you know finding out more about your background and things and yeah i look forward to uh seeing you in person at something in the uh in the near future some course or some conference or, or something but no it's been great catching up with you mate it's been really good and peter i've really got one one big burning question and this is what everyone wants to know and if you follow thin on instagram you'll want to know this as well where do you get your shorts 
They're sprayed on. They're sprayed on. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, right? There must be some sort of thread that has been developed somewhere to keep seams together. <laughs> in I like must be I in must the most be stressful situations. I have I have tried and I have tested so many shorts in so over so many years. But the only shorts that I have found that actually work well for me are Lululemon. They are undoubtedly oh, talked. <laughs> they are the best I, and I um, I have no joke I think about seven pairs of the same shorts that have accumulated over the past number of years um, I can you remember Don John spoke about sh- shark habits that shark habits yes you just... bait and you're done yes. I was just like that's so me when he told me that um, uh, less less time uh, thinking more time doing basically it allows you so yeah, if you see me, I'm most of the time always wearing the same clothes, but they're not the same clothes that I've worn for a number of days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> um, you was. But what, what is cool is because, like, obviously, you know, Finn does a lot of lifting, so his shorts are, are like, at the, you know, they're at pop the forefront pretty much all the time. But just because he's bigger, got a big ass, doesn't mean he's an Instagram influencer <laughs> in that way. He's actually genuine. Well, I did see, I did see James Priest stole a pair of your shorts the other week. He was climbing up a mountain, wasn't he? <laughs> I'm waiting to be, uh, I'm waiting to be uh, taken on as a Louis Lemon ambassador. I, uh, I may start tagging him in a few posts. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, on that note, um, James, do you want to say goodbye? Yes, goodbye. We'll see you next week. Uh, Peter, say goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. We'll see you next week. Who we got on? I think we've got. Hopefully, we've got Lauren Brooks next week. Lauren Brooks next week. Yeah, yeah. From and Finn, do you want to? Oh, sorry, Finn. Do you want to say goodbye? Ah, uh, yes. Just want to say thank you to uh, Peter, Paul, James for all ha- for having me on today. I, I appreciate the time. I do know it kind of went off the beaten track a wee bit, but um, I hope people take value from it and. Keep up the great work, lads. He's doing a good job. Thanks. Thank so, you. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to the show. This has been episode 34. Um, of course, as, as with ever, uh, please do subscribe, share the post. You can find us on YouTube as well and all the, the major providers. So if you've got friends you think this might be of value to, so send it to them. Please write reviews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But thanks for listening. We'll see you next week with Lauren Brooks. It's Health Oddity. Take care. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett, and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey. Health Odyssey.